Howdy once again, it's Tubal Kane, your YouTube shop teacher, this time with part 5, the final episode of the Atlas milling attachment build, and here is the completed one. This is pretty much the model here, the original Atlas that uh, I happen to have, but uh, many people that do not may be interested in building this, and remember that it was modeled uh, basically off of this uh, popular science uh, article by Harry Walton clear back in April of 54 and you can find that on Google I've said that many times now I make a video like this over about a eight or ten day period so sometimes I repeat myself I realize that I don't know what I said in the earlier episodes so bear with me if uh, I do repeat myself go back and watch those earlier episodes if you're interested in it and uh, you followed me through this no blueprints but uh, remember I made wooden models uh, concept models prototypes that's kind of how I work there is no measured drawings but here it is and in the last episode I showed you how to uh, zero it out and a few things like that so I'd like to carry it one step farther in this video and show you uh, some of its uses over the years I've made uh, many different videos on the use of these attachments and here are some of them if you want to go back and look at them because I'm not going to cover all of this again because it would be repetition. Also some of these were used or, 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 or videotaped in some of my video courses, my Logan and my Atlas and my South Bend courses. So check these out if you're interested to see how to use these. But I'm going to show you some simple setups here. In uh, just a minute, we'll step on over to the Atlas lathe. So join me, please. Okay, I'm over here at the Atlas lathe. And this is a 12-inch lathe. So if you have a 10-inch lathe, there might be uh, different modifications that you have to make to this. I'm not sure. But uh, looking at the way it's set, once you get uh, your setup made, make sure that you have all of your screws good and tight, including these two back here because it lacks rigidity as the way it is. Now, there's a lot of uh, capabilities in this attachment because it can be set at the zero point, and I show you how to zero it out in the last video, but any different uh, degree that you would want, and that can be done with the protractor that's built in down here, or you can use a protractor like this uh, set up against your chuck as a reference, any angle that you would want, but probably most of it will be in the zero position like this or in the 90 degree however it's not going to work in this direction probably because there just isn't enough travel here and by the way if this is exposed you might want to put some tape or something over there to keep chips from getting down into that screw but if you're working on the end of a piece like this you may need to swing it around like this the visibility is more difficult but at least you have the travel here in your cross slide that would allow you to do that and then here's the work right here so quite a bit of capability in that axis similarly the vise can be by loosening these and I think you know this already tilted at different angles this is a work piece here whatever angle you may need and then uh, you can do compound angles you know in conjunction with uh, this axis and this axis so it's, it's very capable of, uh, of different things uh, just pretty much up to what your uh, imagination can uh, conceive if you uh, look at this little chart here you can see that uh, we have assigned uh, X Y and Z axes to uh, these different movements so from right to left with the carriage is the Z up and down with this is Y and then back and forth on the cross slide is the X so you got X Y and Z so you can uh, consider those uh, uh, assignments there uh, when you're discussing or when I'm discussing the movement so when you're moving the carriage in the Z axis, you can use dial indicators to position it because there is no other uh, coordinate or measuring device there. You can use your carriage stop here along with your graduated dial to determine how deep you're going toward the headstock. So th those are both handy, but remember a dial indicator is extremely accurate. Again, in the vertical direction, which we call the Y, we have the graduated dial up here. So 
Uh, and you could use indicators also, but this is typically what you would use here, and it would be uh, pretty accurate for that. And then moving in and out with the cross slide, which is the x-axis, we have the graduated dial right here, or you could use an indicator. So you have uh, good control in all three directions, all three axes, by uh, the means that I just explained to you. Or, of course, you can just go by a layout line, which would be the easiest. I would suggest, if possible, that you limit your work to relatively small pieces, but if you have a longer piece or a larger piece than, say, this, something like this, you really need to, to limit that because there's just too much hanging out of the vise and the work is going to vibrate and possibly even break the cutter. It might be possible to do that, I haven't tried it, but on a longer piece like this you also could uh, clamp that down, mill a portion of it within the range or limits of your cross slide, then unclamp it and move it, in other words do it in sections and that would give you a little bit greater capability. But I would respectfully submit that you need to take light cuts, uh, slow feeds, uh, relatively slow spindle speed, plenty of oil, and everything that you can do to avoid chatter and, uh, and discouragement in using this. It, but, it, but it can do certain jobs, but it's not like a bridge port. So to take that into account and under advisement in all of the setups and all of the work that you do on this. And generally softer materials like aluminum, brass, and mild steel are going to be so much easier than if you have a piece of tool steel or, or uh, stainless steel or something that is difficult to machine on really any machine. And use sharp new cutters if possible. Now let me suggest this to you when you're holding end mills that really is not proper to hold a hardened end mill in a three jaw chuck. Why? Because we have a hardened shank here and these are hardened jaws. It just does not grip it and it can come loose and what often happens with a cutter, and that is true of any machine, is that the helix tends to want it to screw into the work. And it'll happen so slowly and so insidiously that you may not notice it until your work is spoiled or all of a sudden your cut is so deep that, that you have a crash or something like that. So a three-jaw chalk is not the way to hold an end mill. I really need to emphasize that. And so how should we do it then? And similarly, and I hope this doesn't sound like I'm scolding you, but a drill chuck is no good either. And I'll tell you why. First of all, you're holding it in by a Morse taper and that can uh, loosen. Secondly, we're back to the same thing here. Hardened cutter, hardened jaws, and it does not grip and it can work its way out. But really the most important thing, and this goes for the Bridgeport mill too, if you are milling with this type of chuck, remember that the arbor is held into the chuck by a Jacobs taper. And that is to, uh, uh, that holds it fine for drilling in this direction, but when you put pressure up against it like this, it can the chuck can fall right off of the Jacobs uh, taper. So this also, to me, is a no-no. Some of that, of course, is my opinion, and I've experienced all of this over the years. So how should we hold it? Okay, most of you are going to use one of the following methods here, but first of all, make sure you protect your thread, and that can be done with this homemade one. I've shown you how to do that, or here's the commercially made one. And uh, remember, if you ruin your thread here, you pretty much have ruined the lathe. So tighten that down, and we have a, a wrench uh, to take that off. And also, when you take this off, it will loosen the collet adapter. I'm talking about collets now, so there's the collet adapter. Make sure that your spindle is clean when you put that in, and hit that. So you can use uh, one of these... Uh, 3C collets. You may or may not have a set of these and I'll have to admit that these cost a king's ransom when uh, including the drawbar. So you may not have that, you may not be able to afford it, but there's a 3 8 collet and of course it has a, a keyway and you turn it until it lines up and then on the tailstock end we put the drawbar and Turn that until the thread is engaged, see it getting pulled in, and then the cutter, of course, being held like that. Now, if you do this, 
hold the cutter as choke it up as short as possible. Don't hang it out like that. You're going to break it and you're asking for trouble. So in as far as you can and tighten it down real well. Now there still is the possibility with collets on any milling machine of again the cutter helix screwing, I'm going to use the word, screwing its way out into the work. So that's always a possibility but probably a long shot with this type of collet. But let me show you what Sears and Craftsman and all these companies really recommend for milling. So this is what Sears and Atlas recommended and you'll find this in the old Craftsman catalog. These are end mill holders or tool holders that fit directly into the spindle. Now we get a number two or a number three Morse taper in the spindle so this would fit directly into the spindle and notice there's a thread here and then this is a homemade drawbar they do have one but I, I didn't have it so this is just made out of threaded rods so that this will pull and get drawn into you must use a drawbar or this could work its way out uh, as a remote possibility this one will work directly this is from Sears you can see it's a bit corroded I had to clean it up this is uh, also from Sears or Atlas I forgot this is a 3 8 also with a drawbar but if you have one of these you would have to use it in conjunction with this but this also could be used on the number of the six inch atlas lathe so that that's probably what it was designed for but you have a sleeve it'll fit into uh, the 12 inch or the 10 inch so that is the correct way and then when you uh, put an end mill in there that's what that little flat spot is for they call it a weldon shank so line up the set screw with that and it's, it can't pull out and these are very accurate there will be no run out this is one that I made and it is in uh, one of the in my my archival videos so that that's a homemade end mill holder before I was able to get these now if you were to buy this one let's say or come across it in the Sears catalog actually it's Atlas this is the original mouse eaten box and in that they're a bit rusty, but these are different adapters or sleeves that will allow you to hold different size end mills. Notice there are four sizes. Different size end mills in this holder. So you only need one of these if you have a set of these in that little slot or hole, of course, is for this set screw. So that's really the best way to hold it. And the other thing is these do not stick very far out of the spindle. Of course the collet doesn't either, but if, uh, if you're using chucks that uh, will allow the end mill to be way hanging way way out and lacking rigidity. So this is what I'm going to use in the brief demonstration, and it won't, won't be a very long demonstration at all, to hold the end mill. This is recommended. Now out of this book, and I'm giving them credit so I don't violate any copyright in this, uh, McCarthy was my teacher at the university that wrote this book. But looking here at this picture, I want to talk briefly about climb milling and conventional milling. You want to avoid climb milling with this attachment. Now I do it on the bridge board and sometimes I get uh, a very fine cut. I, I like it for finished light cuts but it is to be avoided on the attachment and I'll explain why as we go along here but this is climb milling this is conventional milling notice the rotation of the cutter is the same never run a cutter backwards you'll ruin it very quickly but in conventional milling the uh, the work is fed in climb milling is just the opposite in other words the cutter is trying to climb up and over the work no good so this being the work, this being the cutter, cutter always running in the same direction. If we're feeding in like this, there is no chance of the work getting jerked in and, uh, and breaking the end mill or uh, causing a havoc with conventional milling. Now climb milling is just the opposite. With the work being fed in from this direction, can you see that the cutter is trying to climb up over the work? And what can happen is suddenly it'll jerk the uh, free end play or the, the backlash out of the work. So you'll get that movement, maybe not that quantity, but that can break the end mill or, or uh, 
shatter it or get, give you a bad mark in, in the work because we cannot totally control all of the backlash in a lighter uh, duty machine like this. So do avoid at all costs uh, climb milling and you might have to just learn that by experience if this doesn't make much sense to you. Continuing to talk just a little bit about climb milling, remember that this is backlash. Can you see that moving? That's the play in the nut and the screw. Some of that can be taken up by tightening the gib screws and it, for certain operations using this little attachment you may even want to tighten one of the gibs, in other words to lock it in that direction if you're not feeding in that direction. Similarly here on the cross feed up here, or I should call it vertical feed, uh, we, we will have some play in, in this. There's always going to be some play in uh, the gibs. Uh, so you can snug those up, but if you snug it too much, of course, this is difficult to, to turn. But in a large milling machine like the Bridgeport, the entire table is so massive that it takes quite a bit of force to jerk that uh, backlash out of there. So th that backlash will be one of your constant uh, nemesis when you <laughs> use this attachment. So I have tightened up the drawbar on the far end. I won't show that. And I've protected the thread, and we've got a half inch end mill in there, and, and I'm at uh, about uh, six or seven hundred RPM. And you can look up the RPM in, in various charts. I don't want to get into that now, but don't run it too fast, or you can burn up your, uh, your cutter. And turn off the, the feeds. You probably will not want to use feeds, so put your uh, feed uh, reverse lever here in neutral position and do not use power feeds. This is half inch round stock and I'm just going to mill a little bit of a flat here to no particular dimension but once I, uh, I feed in and establish my depth of cut I will lock the carriage right here so that it doesn't get pulled in. So keep your your wrench on that and, uh, and use your carriage lock whenever applicable. Okay I've raised or lowered this until I'm about on the center, that is the center of the work is about on the center of the tool and I'm just going to feed away from me and I've already established a depth of cut. Then I can back it out and increase the depth of cut by moving the carriage in just a little bit and I'm not using any oil at this time for clarity. And that's cutting pretty nicely. Now, with this size cutter, I wouldn't be able to cut all the way across here because I would hit the vise. If I wanted to, to make a flat all the way across a piece of uh, stock, I would use a smaller diameter end mill, probably a 3 8 And that's what it looks like. That's all the farther that I went in. Notice that I was holding it without the extra little jaw, and I was in the, the V groove here because it was round stock, and that held it nicely with these two set screws. Now I'm going to square off the end of the round work and actually that's a facing operation we probably do on the lathe but I'm just showing you how to do it now and that uh, it's kind of difficult to see and normally you have to get your head way back here make sure you're wearing safety glasses and when I start feeding that is raising the work up into the cutter that will be conventioning, conventional milling. If you did it the opposite direction that would be climb milling. So let's see what this looks like. We'll just take a, a light cut to square it off. This is half inch aluminum. It's a half inch cutter so it's not really quite wide enough to make it in one pass. But notice how I'm holding and I got that other vise jaw on, on the, the vise. And I am at 
the end of the travel right now. So I can't quite finish that up. The work would have to be repositioned a little bit in the vise. I am at the end of the travel. So you can see there are certain limitations here on uh, this machine, this attachment. And I brought the uh, work back to the other position. I couldn't go back the other way because uh, then I would be climb milling. So now I will lower the work into the cutter and take another pass. And yes, you do have to baby this a bit. You may see a little vibration. However, it is a little bit uh, sturdier and rigid than what I thought it would be. And again, I'm out of travel. But it is satisfactory. And it could take another uh, couple passes in order to clean it up. Or to go to your layout line or whatever your dimension happens to be. Okay, that's it. This video was long enough. I'm not going to show you any other operations. You can refer to those other videos I showed you near the beginning of this chapter so for the uh, doing old keyways and different things like that. So there are almost endless uh, possibilities to using this, but it'll all be smaller pieces of work, uh, light cuts, and so on. But it might very well get you by if you uh, do not have the luxury of a Bridgeport mill. Well, this concludes what is a very long video series, and, and I'm uh, happy with it. I, it turned out really a little better than what I thought. I didn't know what to expect when I tackled this job, if it could be rigid enough to do the work, because it, remember that the genuine atlas or palmgren is not all that rigid either, because it's always just a compromise between uh, how much you can afford and, uh, and uh, what you can do on a machine. So... That pretty much uh, finishes what I wanted to show you here in the last uh, two hours. hope you liked the video, and uh, some of you, if you would tackle this job, uh, send me pictures of it, and, and uh, I'd like to see what somebody might do with this. So, this is Tubal Cain saying so long for now, and I will see you in the next video.